Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, a podcast focused on the fascinating world of near-death experiences, spirit communication, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. The mission of this project is to share messages of hope and inspiration with others, and to spread the word that death is only an illusion. Thank you for being here with an open heart and mind. I wish you peace, light, and love always. Hello, Magic is Real listeners and family. I'm Shannon, and today I have with me Susan Dyer. Susan is a near-death experiencer, but there's so much more to her story that I can't wait to delve into, and I know that you will find what she has to share enlightening. I hope you'll find it uh, thought-provoking. I, I know, I guarantee you that there is so much that she has to share. So, Susan, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to have you. Um, thank you. I clicked with you, Shannon, like the second you emailed me the first time, actually. Yeah. Um, I just had that feeling. But yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Well, your story, there is a near-death experience, but it's so much deeper than that. And I am so interested to hear about your life, your background, because yeah. as I share often on the pro on the program, uh, I am a 12-step recovery, sex and love addict, um, many years, you know, sober and off bottom lines and feeling great, but I have a self-esteem story. I'm writing a book about it. Um, it's that just everything that you have to share resonates so much with me. So I would love to hear your story, what your background was. I know that you were a born clairvoyant, which, um, I'm a medium. So it's, it, I'm interested in this, um, but I would love to hear your story in whatever way that you would like to tell it and however you're comfortable telling it. Sure. Uh, I'd just like to say for anyone who does not have uh, or share the experiences I have, or, you know, actually some of my story is actually difficult to digest if it's not been um, a part of your life. and. And for any of you watching who find themselves like having a hard time believing parts of it, I just want to tell you, I totally honor that. And I would be just like that too, if it didn't happen to me. Um, so yeah, I was born clairvoyant and my parents were very conservative, very Catholic. And our church was like, super Catholic, like, you know, um, God was, was to be feared. Do you know what I mean? And, um, for example, one of, one of the, the first issues that led to like that core wound, that's what psychologists call it. It, it always stems in childhood, but like, um, I, I remember, you know, angels and and beings and portals and all that stuff, they'd show up and in the darkness, everything's brighter, obviously. It's like when you go to a movie theater. But I, I remember thinking there was one spirit, I didn't know what to call it, but um, I couldn't even see through it. And it would follow me. Like I, I used to feel like that guy Linus from Charlie Brown. It, he, I think it was Lin Linus. Yeah, with the black oh, he had Somebody. He had the he had Linus had the blanket. That oh no, then Pigpen. He had like a permanent cloud following. Oh him. yes, it was Pigpen. Yes, and I was like, what is this thing? Because because I couldn't see through it, and it was like a crimson red, and it felt for those of you in, in past and Claire sentience like this entity felt like it was very sentient and watching me all the time. And because I did not have any resources to understand this like double world I was living in, one of it seemingly invisible to the rest of the earth, um, I, I grew up believing that that was the devil because church was one of my only resources, you know? And so that started my own self-perception between my parents sending me back into my room every night 
you're not seeing that. You have an overactive imagination go. And between the devil following me, which by the way, absolutely do not believe in that kind of dualistic heaven and hell. Um, I'm just saying, but um, because of my limited resources and because of the reactions, the minimal reactions I, I did receive, I knew immediately, like in a survival tactic kind of way that I had to never, ever talk about this, that something was really wrong with me. And on top of that, because the devil was like following me that on top of it all, there was something innately bad about me. And I, I grew to believe, to believe those misperceptions. Like they became my truth. And over the years, they kind of crystallized into me feeling like across the board unlovable. And it's kind of just like you mentioned, I'm 22 years sober. Uh, I was so uncomfortable in this existence. I actually did not want to be here at all until my near-death experience at 40. And I'm saying that like, you know, I had kids and, um, but I didn't, I, I just, I was like, I, I don't understand, like, what is this? Why is this happening? I don't understand any of it. And the weird thing was, I don't know how I had the grace to like have this thought, but, but when I was pretty young, I did actually think, why would I be seeing all of this that everyone can't see? Like God must have given it to me for a reason. And, you know, I, I was trying to believe that God was good, even though the way I was taught, God was very scary, honestly, a little bit sociopathical, whatever, but I was trying to like, be like, oh, God is good, God is good. So I, I, I really, from a young age was like, there, there's got to be a reason. And why else, if it's not to help, you know, like, why would I just be living in this like, invisible carnival for for kicks you know um and i've gone through a number of dark nights of the soul like it, you know when you found yourself having to transition out of your vocal work like that was devastating and there are so many of us i feel like what I, I've noticed, I've worked with so many women over the years. Our higher selves will do whatever they need to do to get us to remember what we had actually come down here for in the first place. Because we're really rolling the dice here. Like we're going under the veil of forgetting, and we are just like everyone else, betting on the slim chance of remembering enough to awaken, you know, and then get that curiosity and that hunger, face our fears, transmute them, and take that unique alchemy and give it as your gift to the collective. But if you think about it, like if I never got sober, none of this would, would be in place. And I'm very clear about my, my purposes. And that is actually one thing that I'd like to address because it takes a lot of pressure off and that's what I'm about. I'm like, I want, to comfort and inspire, because there's a lot of misperceptions. Um, 
almost every woman who starts working with me, one of their first questions is, what is my sole purpose? I feel like, I feel like I don't know. And like, I, I missed it. And I'm like, okay, first of all, and this is what, what I've, you know, I have guides or whatever, and they teach me, you know, from archangels to deceased, you know, spiritual people like Wayne Dyer, if you guys know him, he's like one of my main spirit guides, you know, um, but we have many soul purposes. Having one would almost be like cruel. It'd be like, you know, us going down and it's like, yeah, find this one needle in a planet, not even a haystack. You know, it's like, that's mean. Like what? Like how am I, that's not possible. And we are so complex. Like if you could see your whole real self, it would blow your mind. Like the structures and the grid work and the portals, the chakra portals and the, and the layers of the aura and how they connect. And um, before we come down, we actually select like a core emotional theme that we want to investigate. And then a, a whole bunch of other possible ones. And they're all stored in this eight, in this like eighth chakra, the soul star, which is intentionally out of the fray of the, the mind and body. It's intentionally like up here to, to most accurately receive divine guidance. And then the soul star actually dumps all of that in our heart chakra and it's dispersed from there. And so I wanted to just say, we have multiple purposes and purpose has nothing to do with function. Like earth school has like these two primary tools, emotions and duality. And it's odd, I think for some people, like, well, I was meant to be a doctor. And it's like, if you dig deeper, you'll find that, okay, like maybe, maybe that person's poor purpose is, you know, comforting or the urge to as best we can resurrect, you know, like it, it's an, it's an emotional thing that may or may not have anything to do with your job and nor does it have to. So many women I've heard get like worried, like, oh my God, well, like, you know, I'm in finance, like this is, am I, and I'm like, that's great. Like the modern guru can't afford any longer to like go into a cave with a, like, you know, a famed monk for, a, for several months at a time while their kids are home alone. I mean, it's like, this is like a whole new spirituality than, than in the past. We are meant to like embody God, like on the toilet, while cooking, while on the carpool line, like it doesn't matter. It's 24 seven and it's not a separate shoebox. Like God is not a separate shoebox. I, I remember um, goddess Isis from Egypt and um, her twin goddess Nephthys said to me once, don't box yourself in by boxing God out. And I, I kind of see that as like a lot of people may go to church for an hour or go to a yoga class for an hour. And like, that is their spirituality when actually like we are God. And um, I, for me, my aim is to embody that energy, you know, consciously. And my guides and I have an agreement, like, please, can can your job, my spirit guides, not my higher self, but like, can, can you guys make sure that I do not miss any like breadcrumbs from God, you know? And I'm not religious, by the way. I, 
I, I don't uh, belong to any religion. Um, I just say, really, God, I guess out of habit. But that was my childhood. <laughs> I had so many dark nights of the soul because I was living so fraudulently. And it took that near-death experience to finally kind of shed everything that wasn't authentically me. So I was a late bloomer, you could say, you know? Um, and I don't know, do you want me to kind of take you through the near-death experience? Just like kind of- Yeah, I'll go, I'll, uh, I, I wanted to let you, that was so beautiful. I didn't want to interrupt you at all. Oh, I wanted to you. let you finish that thought. I, there's so much to unpack. Yeah, I know. It's like, it, which I love because I could start anywhere, but I, yes, we're going to talk about your near-death experience. I just want to touch on the fact that um, it's just so relatable to me about, and thank you for remembering that detail that I shared with you about losing my voice. And it's not about me, but I here, but I wanted to say that when it happened, when I, I'm, I was a working voice actor, mm -hmm making six figures and everything was cool. Oh, and, it, yeah. and, and it was new. It was came later in life. So it wasn't like years of, I had struggled to get there and I was so happy and on top of the world. And then I lost my voice, my ability to perform for two years. I could not, I had muscle tension, dysphonia and vocal cord dysfunction. And I still do, but it's manageable now. And I, uh, I remember being in this booth and screaming. I was so angry, like yeah. screaming the best yeah. I could and saying, I know there's a reason for this, but why totally. this isn't fair? Like, I, yeah. I oh my have... God, the, the, tell my me, guys, no, tell me. two names for me. They're like, you're the question machine and you're the, it's not fair police. <laughs> like, I know I try not to be, but you know, we're, we're, we're so, so mad. mad. Yeah. And I, but I knew, and it's so funny because I want to say this only to give people, you're going to give so many, uh, so much insight that also brings hope. My little nugget is that three years later, I know exactly what happened. You know, it's, it's all about the work that I'm doing now. This, this, this right here, there yeah. was a spiritual element of me that I wasn't addressing a little bit. 12 step taught me to went from basically being atheist agnostic to understanding in uh, believing in a higher power and understanding that I'm not in control here and that there's something greater than me. And that if I trust it and stop trying to fight the current, things will go a lot better for me. So um, with yeah. that being said, I also know that you, you and I share a similar theme of losing our voices in, in sense of not speaking up of, um, yeah. of not speak. You, you had mentioned in, um, I think it's your website because I know that you coach women as well, spiritual coaching and you talked about when you were married, shutting yourself down. Just and I, I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Not just in relationships, and not just in unhealthy relationships. Even just speaking up when I'm not happy, mm -hmm. speaking up and being yeah. assertive, or saying, "Hey, I don't like that," or "This isn't working for me." Um, and that's also what my book is a lot about: of not speaking up and shrinking. And the fact that you are who you are now, who you're speaking out in so many ways and helping other people is beautiful. Um, and you can speak to that if you like to, I, and then we'll go into, I want to know what it was. You don't have to go into every single detail of the near death experience yeah. because I do want to talk about your insights so much, but I would love to know, I know that my viewers and listeners will love to know. Yeah. What is it that happened that changed everything and what were sort of the general, what was the general experience like for you? Yeah. Um, well, it's very interesting. I do have, I, you're right. Like by the end of my marriage, like I remember I was seeing a therapist and I couldn't even tell her my favorite food, my favorite color. Like I, these are like kindergarten things that, you know, like what's your favorite color? You know, I'm like, I don't know. Like I was so devoid of authenticity. I, I mean, I was just empty but not in a good way. I, can, I, I want to be clear so I can be the most non-distorted, you know, kind of pipeline for, you know, divine guidance. But I find it really more interesting that like you, you lost your voice. 
And it was like, what? Are you kidding me? Really right now? Like you finally got here and then you're like, why? This is not fair. And for me, one of my experiences, I, I don't talk about it much, but um, after the near-death experience, I woke up one day with my clairvoyance gone. And that was so unsettling to me. I, I really, I was, I was very freaked out. Um, you know, like I, I really do believe like everything happens for us, not to us, but like in the moment it's happening, it's real hard to, to, to frame it that way. You know, usually it's afterwards where like we can even begin to frame it neutrally even, you know, but, um, what happened was, and I didn't know this until afterwards, my higher self knows what a lazy sack I am. And she knew that I was never going to, I had felt like th this with my abilities, like my clairvoyance had after the dark night of, of the soul, after my husband and I split, like I, I was seeing through my arm. Um, I, I, I was seeing whole beings like they were flesh, flesh and blood. This energy was like wild and uncontrollable. I was like, I was so scared because, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm clairvoyant. And then I, this happens like, oh my God, whoa. I didn't know there was like more to, to clairvoy, you know? And all this crazy stuff was going on. Like my toilet got like split in half, like a laser and just went like that. And like all this water came out. It was just so crazy. But I was so desperate to get my clairvoyance back that I went to see this woman who did hypnotism. And I was like, I went because my friend said to go. And I was like, fine. But I, I can't get hypnotized. I'm just telling you. And um, I went with, I went to a session with this woman and I wasn't hypnotized. I was completely awake the whole time. I could have been filing my nails. And my real thing that was bothering me is like, why can't I, you know, channel, you know, or why can't I just be talking with everyone I see? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, they're, everyone's here. They're all, they're like, but we, I can't, I can't, why can't I talk with them? And uh, so I went to this woman at a desperation to get my clairvoyance back. Think, you know, she had me channel. And I was like, I was thinking, I'm not channeling. Like, this is stupid. I was awake. I was like, I could have been filing my nails. And um, then, I got in the mail the next day, a 30 page report that I forgot I'd ordered from this man who is like the real deal, you know, um, about one of the past lives I know about. I, I know a few actually, but he actually used like complete sentences that I had just said on this recording the day before because I walked out of there like yeah right and then I read this and I'm like oh my god you know and then this intuition was given at this point where it was like another worst year realized they were like they were like you know what you need to do now and I was like yes I do and that was open my heart and allow emotions in again, because mine were so big, they scared me. Every emotion was like a tsunami. And I had like yellow police tape them away a long time ago. And of course I was stuck because 
the, the portal of the heart is like, you know, Grand Central Station, like everything is dispersed from here. And if your heart's closed, and mine was like intentionally locked, like no motions, thank you. Uh, I'm scared enough all the time as it is. So I had to go through that process. And just like that, clairvoyance comes back. I'm channeling like I breathe, you know. And you had the same thing. We're going to take your voice until you get the orientation right. Like it's supposed to be spiritually oriented. You know what I mean? And um, it just reminds me of your experience. It's like our guides will definitely like tap and then they'll like whisper and then they'll scream and then they'll like body check. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yes. And I know in my case too, thank you for that, for that understanding. You are spot on. And uh, there, you know, like you, I was, I was not in the right relationship and I was just stuffing it all down. Totally. You know, like, yes, not, he's not a bad person. It just was not working for either of us really. And yeah. stuffing it down and stuffing it down and just not speaking up about it and hiding away and, and keeping it all in and eventually I lost my voice, which is so thematically interesting. Totally. So um, I mean, thank your you throat chakra actually yeah. symbolizes, it's not like speech, your throat chakra, that portal represents, am I living according to my authentic beliefs? Am I, you know, is everything congruent? Like the actions I take with my personal truths, like this chakra, you could basically stamp it like your authenticity meter, you know? That's so cool. I, I love that you shared that. Thank you. Um, and it makes perfect sense. I can now tell when I, when I start to flare up that something's not right. Something's out of balance. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for that insight. All right. So. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about your near-death experience, and then we'll go into all the, th and you can even diverge and say what you learned as you're telling it, however you want to. Okay. I think I'm just going to tell it concisely because it's so epic. I just, yeah. I'll get like lost if I yeah. start saying things. Essentially, when my marriage fell apart, which was, I mean, I knew before we were engaged, he didn't even like me, you know, but I, at that point I was so like emotionally distorted and through some other, like uh, some other people in my life, I was like very emotionally abused. And so because my self image was so distorted, I thought, I, if I don't marry this guy, like I'm done. Like no one else is going to want me. Like, I, like I better get this locked down, you know? And, um, it's amazing. Um, but our marriage inevitably, obviously, um, ended. And when that happened, my body had already been trying to tell me. I, was already like something wasn't right. I knew it before this happened. Um, my my doctors kept saying like, oh, you just have depression. And I'm like, no, I don't. I mean, I do, but I have that as a symptom of something yes. sy systemic, you know? And I'm not like a, a medical person. I Except I now, I now know way more than I want to about medical things, but, um, our, our bodies, like when we speak, every cell is affected by that frequency. Like Dr. Emoto did that experiment with monks meditating over water and our bodies are like whatever percent water. And I mean, I had just been thinking and speaking and feeling about myself so badly my body just started reflecting on the outside 
what was going on in the inside. Um, and so I ended up having a huge surgery um, and a diagnosis of chronic Lyme. And I was like on a walker, sometimes on a cane. And at the worst, I couldn't walk. I had to army crawl. And being a single mom, that's like a really bad match. So like, you know, I, I really like, and I still get this nudge from my guys, but I have a hard time asking for help because it's almost like ingrained with poor self-esteem. Like I'm a burden, I'm a burden. And also so many of us are empaths and our natural most natural state is to be giving and giving and giving to the point of depletion. And it's almost like a mistaken period of martyrdom we all have to go through before we realize, wait a second, being of service, like this is cheesy, but like I really do need an oxygen mask because I can't do this without breathing, you know? Um, so I was like partially paralyzed. I had like a port in my arm for like a couple IV bags a day. And I was in incredible nerve pain. And um, my friends kept telling me, you're dying. And I was like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Cause I'm a fighter. I mean, a I used to call myself a cockroach, which, I've upgraded to a hummingbird because I found out hummingbirds are also uh, from the dinosaur periods. So I was like, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. Um, but I, you know, this one night I knew I was gonna die. It was like not an issue. Like I had been to the ER earlier with my dad. They were like, nothing's wrong with you. And I was like, cool. I, I, I was like, I knew that was gonna happen, why? You know? And then that night my friends came over and I was waiting them out. I was like, Can you guys go? I'm I'm so done. I've tried. I have tried. I had tried for like at that point, like uh nine years to to get um everything attended to. And I was so exhausted. I had like no life force left in me. And my kids were at their dad's. And my my kid my uh, friends finally left, and I did my reverse uh, crab walk up the stairs. I was like joyful. I was like finally, oh my god, you know. And then I felt like literally like a spitball hit my head, like somebody would like doing in middle school, like with a straw and like the straw wrapper. And I was like, what? And and my guides were like you have one more chance. You have to get out of your body tonight. And I was like, oh, wait. And Cause I was open. I was like, I did not want to leave anything on the field, nothing. I, I wanted to know I had tried everything for, for the sake of my kids. And I was like, immediately start like negotiating with them. I'm like, but I don't know how to astral travel on command. Like I've never done that. Like I just do it when I do it. And I, and I don't know. And they're like, just get to your bed. I was like, okay. You know, like, just like, all right, calm down. The feeling was, we know we've got you. Like, do you think we'd be suggesting this? And then just like, peace out, you know? And so, um, I got to my bed and, you know, as I was climbing up, um, they said, okay, now lay um, on my side directly on the edge of the bed, like to the point where I'm like, if this doesn't work, I'm definitely going to end up falling on the floor. Okay. So that happened. And they were like, and then roll just roll out, roll out. And I was like, uh, okay. And I did. And, uh, and I have been doing this all my life. And the, the irony is 
I was always so scared of these portals because I thought until that night, they were portals where like, you know, some being was going to come in and get me. And they were always by my head. And I realized, oh my God, I've been making those portals my whole life. And that's how, that's like how I astral travel to different places and dimensions and all that. And so that hit me. And then I was like, wait a second. I, I, I was literally like floating, standing there, looking at this portal. And it was actually weird because usually I look directly into a portal. This portal looked like how you would see a subway train. And it was like black and charcoal gray and going faster than anything I've ever seen. And I was like, that does not look good. I was like, that, I'm like, are, like, that's mine. Like, that's my ride. Where the hell is that going to take me? It, it was really like, I was like, eh, what? Like, where's the light, you know? So I, like, I had to like angle my astral body into it. And then it took me, there were no lights. There were no like, you know, singing of the spears or like, it was just like dark charcoal. And then boom, I arrived in what a lot of people call the void. Um, but it's actually like in like, if you think of a yin yang, that would be like mother God, like the, the womb, you know, the womb of all creation. And, um, but I didn't know that because I still hadn't addressed my fear of the dark as a 40 year old woman. Um, so I just said really quickly, God, please take me somewhere safe and good. And then there is no time, you know, and what that looks like is people always say that what that looks like is before I even finished thinking the first word of that sentence, before I finished thinking the word God, I was there. It's instantaneous. There is no talking. Everything is just energetically exchanged and everything is instantaneous. And not only that, I think this is important to say because I remember being so scared and not wanting to ask Archangel Michael for help because I was like, really? Like, I can't, like, I think people need him more. Like uh, this scared single mom, you know, who's like really, really scared of like, seeing through her arm and stuff like I, I that's not worth like taking Archangel Michael out of the game and then but like any any Archangel or any um personality or any of your ancestors you know they are all attached to much larger spiritual entities and they can be everywhere all at once so don't ever hesitate ever to call on anyone you're not hogging them they're probably helping like three billion other people at the same exact time you know um but god presented to me as blazing golden like rays of light and um yeah i felt like a tea bag and i was just like bobbing in God. And the feeling was so crazy and so confusing. But the first thought I had was, and this, I'm very grateful. I, I can remember this because a lot of people don't like it. It's actually my most like hate watched video I have, but, um, I, I thought word for word, I could have just murdered 10 people right now. And I, I would be greeted just the same. And, and, that, and that reminded me actually, my meditation teacher once said, once compared 
I don't know, actually she was Buddhist, but anyway, this story was like a tree. Think of a tree, a big bushy tree in the middle of, of summer. And the, I'm just paraphrasing, like if Jeffrey Dahmer came under the tree for shade, the tree wouldn't be like, mm, pass judgment, be like, no, no thanks. And like draw up its branches. Just like if like Mother Teresa came under, it wouldn't be like, all right, guys, fluff up, fluff up. You know, it's like, no, there's like only one radio station, like only one cosmic Play-Doh. There's only one medium for everything and all the, the no things, all of the negative space. It's all God. And my kids asked me the other day, like, even our poop? And I was like, yeah, totally, yeah nothing like there's like nothing you know nothing that's not and and then we had this exchange you know he was like do you want to stay or do you want to go and I freaked out because my intention was to try to get some help by like I thought maybe I'd find like some like off-duty angel and like get like a health boost like in a video game you know like when Pac-Man eats a cherry I felt like that was what was going to probably happen. And I was like, no, I want to stay. So I shot up this IMAX sized photo of my kids. And then this is stupid. I know I was afraid God was not going to believe me. So I was like, I better show God. I, I really mean it. And so I started pulling hand over hand on my you know, silver cord, basically. And then I was thinking, oh my God, what are you doing? Like, do you, do you even know where you are? Do you, do you even know, like, this, this could take you like nine years to get back to your body. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? But anyway, God put an end to that, but that, that was, you know, not going to be very um, fruitful. And the exchange we had, like, I love God by then, you know, I had my own spiritual practice and my own idea of God. And, you know, I have my own meditations and, you know, prayers really, which is just me talking. But um, I did think God was loving by that point, but I also thought he was like a vague a vague yet loving energy source. And it's like, that was not my experience at all. The other uh, major thing that I realized, and this, uh, this also is hard for people to maybe believe because it was hard for me, but I realized I, I was like a, a two-pronged plug plugging into the outlet and that there was literally no separation. Like I'm not a daughter of God. I'm a dollop of God who wanted to and explore, a, you know, a certain emotional theme and I'm here role playing for like a whole 30 seconds. You know, according to the game plan, we all mapped out before we incarnated, you know? And just, I think my Catholicism, because it was so, I've had some really crazy experiences. Like one time we were at this Christian ranch for vacation, which I don't know why. And I, I got like taken hostage by the female uh, wrangler who was in charge of the youth. And she had been like grooming me. I didn't know what was happening. I, I actually really didn't know. I actually thought maybe that she was homosexual. I, cause I was like, I didn't understand like why, like I she kept following me all the time, asking me these questions, like some of which kind of scared me. And then she finally like, locked me in the saddle room and really scared me. You know, she pulled out, like she always had a pocket Bible and she, she was reading these, these things that were just 
very frightening. And um, and um, so I don't know, I kind of closed off to that. But but after we had this exchange, you know, it took me several weeks before I had the courage even to in the privacy of my own home, ask God, I really, I need to ask you something. And I'm, I'm very worried you will take it the wrong way. And I don't mean it the wrong way. I don't mean it arrogantly. And I know about like hubris, and, but I just, I have to say like, when I was with you, you know, I, I knew I was you. And, and like, even just saying this, like weeks later in my own head in silence, I was like the old Catholic in me felt like I was going to get struck, like smited or something, you know? And, um, and, and that was like the glorious whole point, you know, guess what? Yeah, you're totally right. And when people are you know, they say like, they're so shocked when anyone makes a statement like they can speak with God, but it's like, of course, and, and you could too. It might require you to really open your mind to a concept that you hadn't considered, but every, everyone, everything, is one and um after that all of a sudden jesus appeared and and i was like still a little sassy i was like oh right i was like what like i know i know you didn't have blue eyes and like light brown hair what is happening like and your robe is like 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 you know i don't know dry cleans like off white beauty i'm like give me a break. I'm like this. I know you didn't look like that. You know, I, I, I was like, and, but he presented like that because I would, I, I would like, boom, I'd know who, who he was, you know, but I, I just was like, what? Cause I hadn't, I didn't think I had ever, like any connection to him. Um, and he just held his hands out, his palms out. And he was like, do you want to get better? And I grabbed his hand. We started flying through all these shades of green. And I was just shouting over and over. I'm going to get better as fast as I can. I'm going to get better as fast as I can. It was really beautiful. And at the end, he said, is there anywhere else you want to go? And I was like, oh my God, yes. Um, and again, for anyone watching who it has a hard time with this, I, I absolutely understand. Um, but I was like, yes, I, I told him I wanted to go to a, a particular spacecraft because, you know, I have many galactic guides, you know, like one of them is a mantis beam and um, one guide of mine who, I mean, I named him Perry and I, I've known he doesn't have a body. He's like a light being, you know, but I knew if I could, if I could get onto this one ship that he could present as an embodied being. And like, we could actually like hug and like, I could actually be like, Carrie, you know? And so boom, we were there. And Jesus was like, is this the right one? And he pointed because next to, to one of the holes was this huge panel like, you know how in medieval times, the shields would show you like what house, like the lineage. So this was this large description of symbology, not mathematics. I thought, you know, I'm like, everyone says like mathematics is like the universal language. I don't know. These were all symbols. And it, it, it was saying like, this is where we come from. These are the beings on board. This is our mission. This is where we're heading, like everything, you know, like how we do with ships, except more extensively. And I was like, yes, this is it. And then boom. Um, and this was created by me and uh, Perry and me. 
to be comfortable, kind of like Jodie Foster in contact. contact. Yeah. So I found myself, I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. In a 1950s NASA gift shop. Um, and I was like, no way. I'm like, this is perfect. And um, I looked over across the room and I saw Perry. And I swear to God, from the neck down, he was my father, like down to the brand of his boat shoes, literally everything about him. And then from the neck up, it was like another white middle-aged man. And then this really annoyed me, but I think we did this in case like to just give me a second to be like, okay, there was somebody, there was a being talking to him and I was over there and I was like, looking at the keychains like hanging and I was like can you get the hell out of here I'm like I don't know how much time I have all right like can you please but now I'm like okay I wanted to give me a second to get my bearings and then when the guy when what whatever or whomever that was left I just like ran up to him and like just like biggest hug you know just like it was so amazing and and then we had this very symbolic but nonsensical conversation of, well, you know, Susan, if you want to work here part-time, and I was like, I'd love to, yes, you know, um, just like, you know, just, it just, just crazy. I know how it sounds, but it's so amazing getting to hug him. And, um, and it's funny because one of his signs for me on earth is a hand and especially Anytime somebody touches a hand to their face, you know, and to get to actually hug him like that just meant so much. And then I came to, and when I came to, I sat up very abruptly. I looked at my cane, which was like waiting, like leaning against my nightstand. And like, I knew, I was like, I'm never going to need that again. And I, I was like, just hopped out of bed, completely normal. And we were about to start chelating uh, my blood because I had so much iron in it. And my, I had this appointment already scheduled and my um, doctor, hematologist was like, Susan, would you like to explain to me how you have zero iron in your blood? And I was like, yes. I was like, actually, this is gonna be really weird. But I did have a near-death experience and I did heal with Jesus. And he was like, okay. And he really didn't know what to say. I haven't seen him since. So you were honest. I know. I was like, I'm gonna tell you. I was like, I don't care. I, you know, because the, the other thing I forgot to mention, um, which was like, honestly, my worst fear come true was I directly promised God that I would live transparently. That's how it was said. And I knew what that meant. It meant, guess what? Uh, time to come out of the spiritual closet and lay it out on the table. So everyone else like you knows they're not alone and can hopefully take some comfort and inspiration and direction. And I was like, cool. So I'm going to go on YouTube. Yeah. And I, I'm going to talk about like extraterrestrials and stuff. And uh, my dad's going to be like, totally you know I, I was like my father is going to disown me my my dad was like so like such a perfectly square peg in such a perfectly square uh, hole and like the dc kind of square peg in a square but i was like oh my god like no one's going to talk like the people i've gone to school with are literally they are going to do a mass exodus this is not like how we roll in DC. And I was right. 
And that is something that I'm still trying to uh, accept without resistance because even like, like, you know, best friendships of like 18 years, like I have one friend left from my, you know, my whole life. Um, and she doesn't understand any of this, but she also like doesn't judge it at all. And then I have a friend I met a couple of years ago through this and, and, you know, those two people are like my world. None of them live near me. But I mean, I'm, I went to knowing like hundreds of people to having two friends and my parents really not under, you know, I was very prudent in the way I, I told them. I actually took a business class before calling my dad because I was like, I really want this to be thoughtful. And I honestly, I really wanted to keep our relationship. I was very worried that this would be too much. And um, so I prepared like as thoughtfully as I could for that conversation. And it's interesting because I've heard this from a number of my friends who left, but he said something very honest to me. He said, you know, what, what you used to tell me at night it, it scares me. And I was like, oh, because that, that reframed my childhood. I was like, I took that personally when he was like, you know, he, but it scared him. And over the years, he's, he knows it's real. Like, because there have been times when like, his dad has told me to say very specific things that I don't even know what they mean, you know, like medical or otherwise, like he, he knows. However, there, a part of him is still, it still scares him. And, and what I've heard the most from all of, of my friends who have left, they use the phrase, oddly, I've heard this phrase so many times, um, that I freak them out. And I find that to be very odd because like my greatest wish for a legacy is to kind of like minimize or like erase any fear attached to the concept of God, you know? Um, and it's just bizarre to me that like talking about archangels like would create that kind of reaction because I am only like, I do not buy into negativity. I don't like, I understand things are difficult sometimes, but like my North star is like we talked about, everything happens for us, not to us. Um, so yeah, that, that's what happened. And it's, it's been, I mean, my life honestly is magical in one sense. I live in a movie, literally. I mean, it's like, I was talking to my friend the other day. I'm like, do you realize like people go to the movies, to sci-fi movies to like, see like how we live every day? Like it's so weird. Um, but it's also been very lonely. <laughs> and Jesus and I would argue about this whole issue. And I'd be like, I'm weird. And he's like, you're not weird. And I'm like, numerically speaking, I'm in the minority. You have to agree with that. And he was like, all right, listen, you're not weird. You're early. And basically it was like, the pendulum is about to begin to start going back in the direction of the divine feminine. And when it does, and God knows how many years that takes, math is not my forte, but like when the pendulum is at the divine feminine in the same way that now it's at the divine masculine, myself or, or my friend would be just like everyone. But we knew that and we chose 
to come in to really, you know, help kind of get that momentum going of like first stopping the pendulum and like maybe even beginning to get it moving the other way. That is coming. You know, the age of Aquarius is rolling in and that's going to be an incredible moment, momentum for us, you know, for any of um, the, you know, the empaths or the light workers or the seekers or whatever. So if you do feel alone, I do want to say that Jesus told me, you know, you're, you're not weird, you're early. And though it didn't bring me immediate friendships, it was one of the most comforting things that, you know, has been told to me. That's beautiful and so relatable. I mean, I haven't, coming out as a medium already, you're like, mm. okay, what are people going to, they're going to think I've lost it. Um, fortunately, yeah. I've gotten nothing but love or just no comments. And I've, yeah. oh, I've had, really? I'm also, I've also lived in LA most of my life, but oh, um, yeah, no. so mm. I, it, it's received very well, or at least with yeah. open-mindedness, even if, totally. and I've had friends say, okay, I mean, I don't believe in it, but myself, but I support you and what you're doing. Like it, 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 one of my friends is an atheist and he keeps saying, I'll produce your, I'll help produce, produce your podcast. Like, what do you, I, I'm happy to see you doing this, even That's though, he, yeah, yeah, which is beautiful. We don't, it's the great. I love that. I, I yeah. honestly, because that's why I always say on my stuff, like I honor all beliefs and non-belief. Like me too. I, I, I do feel like you would hope adults could allow everyone to just be themselves, you know, but, but it's, it's difficult that what you described, especially when it comes to, you know, an atheist and yeah. a, a medium. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Yeah. That is like, if only the world could allow everyone to just be their authentic self without judgment and yeah. receive the same in return you know I mean that, that that's so beautiful and one of my best girlfriends too was an atheist and now she said I have to believe it because I know it's you because you're experiencing it wow. and I and she said I know you and I you've opened my mind to it so it's mm. it's beautiful um I wanted to ask you to, when you talk about the age of Aquarius kind of coming in, what do you think that looks like? So actually, I, I, this is, okay, actually a huge part of this, have you heard of like Carl Jung's work with archetypes? I've heard of it and I don't know a lot about it. Okay. So by the way, Carl Jung had a near-death experience. I'm obsessed with him. I did not know I'm this. Like, now I will be too soon too, knowing yeah, this. I'm yeah. I'm like his fan club on earth, like fan chair of the fan club. But but he he had a near-death experience and it was very different than mine, but it informed his work going forward. And he became most interested in archetypes. And the easiest way to describe them is um, in tarot, which by the way, I, well, anyway, there's so my, my, many misbeliefs about that, but in tarot, there are like 72 cards or something, but there's like 21 major arcana cards those are archetypes oh yeah there are themes yeah, yeah. Our, our major it's themes. actually kind of like the fool's journey you know or the hero's journey yes and it doesn't matter what language you speak if i held up like the sun card you would have a reference for it and that's because it's so integral to the human experience like across the board uh that you don't need to like to to know the what sun stands like means or how you pronounce it but you know what it is 
And so in the age of Aquarius, one thing that's going to be major is a shift to symbolism and looking at things in a more collective type view. Like Aquarius, even just in the Zodiac. And by the way, if anyone's listening, I just want to say, I used to think that astrology was so silly, but I was reading like the paragraph at the end of Cosmo, you know, at, like at, in, in my twenties yeah, or something. Me too. The real study of it. There's a reason it's been around for like centuries. The real study of it would knock your socks off. Like it, it's insane how like it can be such a great tool, like as a mirror to like kind of check yourself. Um, but we are going to switch towards like less like every man for himself and more to, to the orientation of what's best for the collective and with an emphasis on the future and a greater flexibility mental a greater mental flexibility is going to be seen you know where people who may have made up their minds like in this age coming up they may find themselves opening their minds for the first time and the people who are come in during this age, they are already like just one big open box. They are here to take care of the planet and the human collective. They are future oriented. It's really like a mass movement of unselfishness and progress for our entire collective. That's beautiful. There's going to be kind of, they're just telling me this, like there's going to be kind of a push for um, less divisions, less hierarchy. Um, you know, we're already seeing, I don't really know this because, I don't watch the news. I'll be honest. I don't either. No, I can't. <laughs> oh, I anymore. love you. I'm like my. I can't anymore. I I don't. Yeah, but there. But my guy just saying like um, there there's already some momentum with uh organized religions. You know, people kind of like beginning to explore other paths toward uniting or embodying God. You know, it's like we see it with religions already. But if you look at all the divisions, like there's so many, like this is a state and and this is a county and this is a governor and this is a I don't even know what they all are, but like there is this um age is coming in and it really is like over time like long time but like it is really here to dissolve like the rigid hierarchy we see everywhere honestly at this point good Thank and it's you. like yeah. what's best for all you know capital a that's yeah. encouraging. I just went to see Avatar with my mom, Avatar 2, with my mom last night. And this is, it felt so thematically like yeah. that. that's what that movie is about. I mean, it's about love. It's about family. It's about, but it's just even the, how they tell, how they speak telepath, they speak yeah. telepathically yeah. with creatures, with animals, with one yeah. another. Yeah. And, it's all energy. It's a beautiful spiritual. That I, I haven't stopped thinking about that 
film since I saw okay, it. Okay, so I have thought about this so much. Yeah. Okay, I'm a, I am a the biggest movie nerd you have ever met. I cannot explain to you the lengths to which I go to like read and watch every single interview possible. Me too. That's what I've been doing all morning. Is the obsessed? Yeah. yeah. It's and like how as, did they make this movie? What was the what was behind well, it? That's Who were the, the thing. people? Yes. I, and James Cameron, I'm like, yeah. So guess who channeled that movie? Because those beings, those feline beings, those are like, so there's two planets, Sirius A and Sirius B. One of them is a water-based planet. And the dolphins and whales and such are just like, of a collective of a much higher consciousness and some of them even can walk. And there, but, uh, but then the other serious planet is land-based. And those uh, like feline uh, beings, I mean, that's like completely accurate. It, it, so like wow. whenever I see in movies stuff that, that I've seen, you know, that I know that I'm like, yeah who wrote who wrote this yeah who, like I don't I, I want to know who wrote this and it's kind of like you know if you David Bowie I mean he writes about it in his songs all the time yeah talking to the star people and everything like he knew he knew like I, I don't think he had he's saying <clears throat> actually he's saying I did not have the word for it that you use which <clears throat> sorry he means channeling but he was 100 percent aware of his connection with some kind of star energy that was benevolent and guided him and inspired him and i mean you you can just read the lyrics of all his songs and you know you like i i mean he knows. Yeah. There are people who know. They might I not wondered say that. Know. Yeah. I was wondering that as I was watching this film, I'm like, how did he, how did he know? I totally. mean, this, like, this is so, it just was so spiritually yeah. themed and moving and beautiful. Um, you know, I thought, well, it's not my kind of movie. And it turns out it really was. My mom and I were like, that's not my kind of movie normally, but we both go in for the 3D and the IMAX experience. Ooh. So we're like, and we we just were like, that was beautiful. And my mom said, yeah, and it's a good, it's just a good like redemption and re or not, not redemption. Re She's like, it's a good revenge movie, which she didn't mean it in that way. It's not about revenge, but it's, it's taking back what it's taking back what we really are um, because it's become so corrupted. It's so symbolic of the corruption of man and what we've done to what we were given. And if we just, how beautiful it, it was and how we have to complicate it all and how let's get back to that yeah. love and that knowing who we are and, and being able to communicate with the whales and the animals. And so easily it, done. Yeah. It's so easily done. It, you know, it's like, just like, can you, Can you try to open up to that being a possibility? That's all, yeah. you know? Um, and those beings actually, they, they came from Sirius and they went to like Lyra, Lyra and felines. I don't know if Lyra is like a constellation or a planet or something, but they're, they're very, very um and you know spiritually evolved you know um there's like something i call <laughs> the um hollywood stigma loophole that like if what is said is in the modality of like a song or a movie then that's okay Right. You know, and I'm like, yeah, like my dad will go watch Star Wars all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even thinking about it. Like, I'm like, mm. um, but yeah, I mean, 
even with Steven Spielberg, he had the same, like he, when he was writing um, Encounters of- Close what, Encounters the of the Third, third kind? kind. Yeah, the Third Kind. kind. Um, but like, because I, I was like, there's no way, like there's no way with the, the movies he's made that he does not have a connection. And, and he was, he, if you can look this up, like he was actually really freaked out because during the process of making that movie, he was like seeing UFOs like a number of times. And he was like, oh my God, what is happening? And I'm like, oh my God, yeah. Because he was but acknowledging yeah. them. Well, yeah, like, and also I think like, you know, he, I don't know how open his conscious mind is to it, but I take that as they were assisting him with yeah. inspired imagery yeah. or, you know what I mean? Like, but I, I don't know that like, if you ask the man, Steve, yeah. Steven Spielberg, like, you know, do you think it's possible to, you know, but they Absolutely. were, it was like, it was a, it was like an acknowledgement and then, but also much more so like they, like those beings wanted to assist yeah. in the portraying of, of, of everything. That you makes know? so much sense. That's so beautiful. And I really want to thank you for bringing that. This has been my viewers will know this because this has been a big theme. And I used to be someone that thought UFO stuff was like, Meh, you know, I don't know that I buy it. I think it's government stuff. I don't really, not that I don't think it's possible. I just don't buy it. And I don't know about these abductions and stuff like that. But after just recently, and people will, if you've watched some of the episodes, will see how I'm sort of finding my way to that as well. And, um, I had Lily Nova on, who's a astro uh, photographer, and she mm -hmm. talks a lot about the star beings. And I realized that I had seen, I had had interactions with um, multidimensional beings and didn't know that that's what it was. And in fact, last night I got back from the movie and I looked up at the sky and I said, I was like, I'm, st I'm still trying to, you know, connect with you. And I didn't see a UFO, but what I did see was a massive shooting star right at the second that I looked up. It was like, I don't, and I thought that could be something else, but I'm going to take it as a sign that I'm getting closer because it was like this kind of shooting star that goes on and on and on and on. And like it's happening. in the cartoons. Yes. Yeah, like it's in slow motion and it's yeah. fiery and it's bright and it just starts shooting across the sky in slow motion. And I just went, I'll take that as a sign um, that we're getting there. But it's, it's so interesting because yes, I wouldn't plunge right into that discussion with I can see why people go that freaks me out or what's going on with you. Are you mentally okay? Um, and that's why I really like to have people like you on the show because you're very grounded. You're very articulate and eloquent. Uh, you're a mom, you're just a normal person. Um, but if we were to start this interview by saying, so let's talk about inter mm -hmm. interdimensional beings and star seeds. And I, I, I would have been someone that would have been like, yeah, this is, I'm not listening to that. I mean, I don't, this, this is a little cuckoo for me. And I'm starting to open myself up to all kinds of things I used to think were way too crazy. Um, and understanding that spirituality and the universe and, uh, well, the universe, it's all one thing. It's it's part of aliens, if we want to call them that, but really they're just other beings. Yeah, we're the same... aliens too. Yeah. Yeah, the other ones, you know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. We're, extra, we're just as much extraterrestrials as all the other races. Um, yeah. And also what I found is that I, I came in very unnatural. Like it's it's rare that like you come in born with something. Usually the, the comfortable way is to gradually awaken later in life when you can handle it. Yeah. Um, but I have found that like, to me, it's not surprising that you are opening up to this idea and you're a bit curious, whereas before you would have really been like, no. And so I've noticed when anyone softens to a possibility, like their guys will kind of keep them, like they'll kind of keep giving more and more 
for you to experience. They're, they're never like, they're not, in and they also like are very aware of what would scare you. Yeah. So, you know, it, it could feel like this is really slow, you know, maybe you're like, why, you know, but if it is, it is only because they are going at a comfortable pace for you and in your integration of this, because it is really difficult for, for most people to, it, it really is a category that people would almost just add, automatically put in the category of movie. Not real life, you know? Yeah, that's why this is named Magic is Real. Totally. Oh my God, I was going to tell you. That's so amazing, that yeah. name. Because like only Magic is Real. You know, like yeah. only. That's it. Like anything else, it's just like uh, some kind of distortion. And and I was thinking about the name of your show and I was like, God, that it is so actually accurate it's scary and, and it made me think of like um magic's connection to the imagination because that's to me your imagination like your like heartfelt imagination is is almost like your chariot like how like that offers you a direct connect to the divine and like uh, Neil Goddard was really big into self-talk. And I used to like verbally, brutally murder myself with self-talk for years, you know? Um, and he, he actually said like, it is your own wonderful imagination that is God. And Joan of Arc, before they burned her, they were like, hey, can you tell us how you talk to God, right? They're like, we, we want to know. Uh, we're going to kill you, but can you just tell us this one thing before we burn you so we can do it? And um, and she said, by my imagination, of course. And wow. I think imagination is really almost like our avenue of alchemy, but it's often misunderstood or minimized in importance you know yeah oh that, that's so beautiful and I could I know we'll talk for more hours and hours and hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. on our own but just for the sake of brevity I just want totally, to thank no. you I'm although that this is I I love this conversation and I I guarantee you my listeners will too um obviously I can't speak for everyone but I know that this mm -hmm. is this is a gem and I want to thank you for bringing your wisdom, your insight, the way that you articulate things, your eloquence, you're a writer, and uh, it shows. You have Thank just you. this way of putting things into words that I could just hang on every one of them. And so I know that you and I will hard bond and talk more, um, plus we're near each other. Um, so yeah, um, I'm in Virginia now. So yes, um, no mistake. Yeah, exactly. So I want to thank you. Is there any, I just want to give you the opportunity to say any parting words. I usually ask my guest, you've said so much, but I still ask this anyway. And just first thing that comes to mind, I ask, what is it that you want people to know? I guess I, I want, I, you know, from my experience, like I would want people to know that literally no matter what you've done or not done, or no matter your beliefs or no matter what, literally, no matter what, you are unconditionally loved. That's it, no matter what. Beautiful, thank you for sharing that. I, that's, that's, that just brings, so everything you've said has been so inspirational and, and really meaningful. And again, I thank you for your time and energy. And I'm so glad that we have connected. Me too. Yeah.